You're all very welcome to the IBI webinar series 2020. Uh, my name is Joan Motherhill. I'm the digitalization lead at Siemens. And uh, the guys very kindly invited me on to facilitate this afternoon session. So for all of you dialing in, you're very, very welcome. I do understand we even have someone registered as far away as Japan. So what was time difference and everything? I hope this is not interrupting too much. And we have a really great lineup um, for this afternoon. Each of the speakers are going to give a 20 minute presentation. If you've used Zoom before, you'll notice there's uh, a possibility to just raise your hand, put in a Q&A. Please feel free to put in questions there. What we're going to do though, is we're gonna do all of the answers to those questions in a panel um, at the end, rather than in between each presentation. And um, that makes sure you stay on for the duration. So we should be finished um, through the presentations by 10 past three, and then we'll do the Q&A. And then we're gonna do a networking session uh, after that. So I hope you can stick around for it. Um, so this is a really interesting topic. Um, obviously, so many of you have signed up. So um, I know that it's obviously of interest to you guys too. We have a really good mix of um, academic research as well as uh, industry live experience, very much from a past, present, present and future of um, logistics and supply chain and the disruption that's happened and experienced over the last while. I know personally, um, if you just reflect back to the earliest days of the last couple of months, um, as soon as people ran into supermarkets and started um, buying toilet roll in bulk and, um, you know, freezer food in bulk, you knew that even every consumer, never mind business owner, knew that security of supply was going to be a critical issue during these times. Um, and that certainly manifested itself in a lot of experiences that businesses have had over the last while. Um, I know myself, just before this all happened, I was speaking at a conference and, and one of the speakers there, amazing presentation. A week later, I was at another conference, the last one before shutdown, and I found out that they'd already gone to a four-day week. They'd gone to a four-day week because they could not get security of supply of materials out of China to Ireland for manufacturing. So whether it was retail or manufacturing, everybody I'm sure has experienced some logistics issues over the last while. So it's great to have such brilliant insights um, from the team at IVI. And just before I kick off and hand you over to our first speaker, I just want to say, just give tribute to, uh, to Michael, Paul and Carol at the IVI who invited me along today, but also put this lineup together. Um, I know they were very much inspired by our first speaker, Dr. Dr. Patrick Rigo Muller, um, who is a lecturer in operations and supply chain at Maynooth University, who certainly flagged this as a really important issue to address um, for this webinar series. So you're all very welcome, as I say, keep your questions, pop them up there on the chat um, for Q&A rather, and, um, and we'll get to them all at the end. But uh, our first speaker, Patrick, over to you. I'm just gonna mute and silence myself now and delete the video of me so you can have it, everyone can give him their full attention. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, and yeah, let's get started with the, the, the presentation. Um, so I suppose, you, you can all see, see my slides. So, um, so my name is Patrick Gamiller. I am a lecturer here in Manus in operations and supply chain management. And uh, indeed, well, uh, no, COVID-19 is a massive issue in, in supply chains. Um, and during this presentation, I will we'll talk about that supply chain disruptions uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, and also we will address in particular no, issues related to digitalization, automation, and also the new imperative of agility for uh, supply chains under these, these new constraints. So uh, my talk will be uh, structured in four, um, four topics, okay? First of all, I'll start with a quick overview about what's going on and what are people thinking about that that just went to the net. Uh, and basically just to show you that you know, questions that people are asking currently about supply chains. Um, then we'll talk about the, maybe this new imperative, imperative in terms of supply chain performance, and maybe we have to revisit what we used to call supply chain agility. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two cases, um, just go towards a little bit of you know, what's happening 
one of them quite recent about what's happening right now, which is the food sector. You've all seen people rushing through online shopping. And there's an, an interesting case between you know, Ocado and Tesco's uh, and their approaches to COVID, uh, different businesses um, and different ways uh, that they used to manage their supply chains. Um, and finally, um, uh, I'll talk about a second topic that happened a while ago when I was much younger. Um, but it's also quite interesting because the current case reminded me of what happened a few years ago, uh, and many years ago, when I was studying the flexible manufacturing systems design uh, within Renault, the French company, by the time we were buying Nissan. Um, and they taught us a lot of things about you know, how digitalization uh, and flexibility should, could, could work together. So let's move on. Um, first of all, um, what's going on today? Okay, um, so basically what are the main impacts from businesses uh, you know, due to, to COVID? So the Freight Transport Association of Ireland made a quite interesting survey, like many other associations, you know, and the results are very often quite consistent between them. Uh, the negative impacts relate, of course, to staff, you know, uh, do I have enough staff to, to, to run my business? Um, many other concerns about, uh, well, my, 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 my revenue. So do I have enough orders coming from clients? No, orders are falling down. My supplies of products, how can I bring products from abroad? Uh, how can I work my service? How can I reach my clients, revenues, etc.? So those are very consistent uh, issues that companies are uh, worried about. But the number one that appears here, and also in using different words, appear in many of them is the issue of the business planning or uncertainty. So basically, I'm in a new world, a lot of uncertainty around, and I don't know what to do. And this, is, this ranks as number one in many of those surveys. You know, what do I have to do? Um, and these are basically the main negative impacts of COVID-19 so far. There are a few positive ones. So I put that just to lift up, lift up the spirits. Um, which is no road congestion are down, uh, pollution are down, they didn't put this one there. Um, and there's another one which is fuel prices, but I'm afraid fuel prices started before COVID. So it was a bit of, a, so this one, let's put up on COVID just to, to lift uh, people's uh, moral. But basically these are the main worries that people have today. Okay, um, if we look um, at, uh, you know, activity indexes, this is the PMI, um, well, things are really bad. Now, this is, we, we can see here the focus on the transport PMI uh, fell into levels never seen before, uh, really, really low in, in Europe. Um, and if you want to, again, have some hopes, uh, we can see that uh, on China, who is in advance with that crisis, no, the, their PMI fell, this is the over PMI, you know, manufacturing PMI, fell sharply, but recovered very quickly after the, uh, the lockdown was over. So we can only hope that we will have, we'll see something similar. Okay, so the growth, the, 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 the index started to grow again soon after the crisis. Um, um, but of course, the results are still not uh, very clear. If, if we look at the trade growth, it's just the third, the third graph at the bottom right. Um, the situation is quite really uncertain yet. There's no clear trend. It's early uh, to see what's going on. And if we, we look at the more logistics indexes, uh, about supply chain management, the same thing, uh, we have the same message, which is something kind of mixed. Um, there is uh, the World Container Index, it's still, let's say, behaving reasonably okay. Uh, things are not as desperate as they were in 2008. Um, prices are, are keeping, which is good for shipping companies. Uh, the, uh, when you look at the Container Throughput Index, which is the actual activity in volumes and containers, in our, Terms of price, uh, there is a drop, a significant drop, but no disaster. Um, we can put it this way: we're just back at um, a few years uh, before, so there's no dramatic change, um, and uh, maybe the beginning of a recovery, as you can see. Um, and um, when we look at the finally at the third one at the bottom left, or to the TAC index monthly, which is the air freight index, we can see here that there is still you no, know, we're still under. Uh, critical flows being managed. We can, you can see here the air freight rates are really high. Uh, why? Due to the lack of capacity to, to bring mostly PPI products uh, from Asia to, to Europe and US. So we have here still very high um, uh, air freight rates 
showing that uh, that's still a critical point. So hopefully th those rates will, will go down again, uh, showing that these issues have been uh, solved. Um, so basically this is an overview. Um, and an interesting thing that happened uh, a month ago, a couple of months ago, 2nd of April, is that the TLU University, the Kuhn Logistics University, it's a university managed, uh, created by Kuhn and Nagel, a big logistician, they, carried, uh, um, they organized a session about the impact of COVID-19 on logistics. And um, that session gathered many uh, experts uh, and I have here gathered just, again, the questions that people are asking uh, themselves about logistics uh, recently. So basically it's just a way to tell you, you know, if you have those questions, you're not alone and everyone else has the same and they are not yet solved. Um, so this is the first um, summary I've made from Alan McKinnon summary. Um, and we have um, a few questions that are conjunctural, questions that are about what's going on right now. And the first one is precisely that. Now, people were asked, okay, how serious is the situation today? And nobody really knows. There's, again, a lot of uncertainty. So uncertainty is a key word here. No, we don't know what's going on today. So it's very difficult to act when you don't know what's going on today. Um, following this one, another one that came very strongly is you know, how to protect people. Uh, so this is something that happened very clearly. People are thinking a lot about how, how to protect the workforce. That's a good thing. Um, a third question that came a lot is how vulnerable are the economic sectors uh, to that crisis? And on that case, more specifically, logistics and transport. So the question people are asking themselves as well is, you know, who's going to be there in 2021? Um, and um, nobody really knows how, how vulnerable they are. So the question of supply chain vulnerability is is quite um, uh, important as well. Um, and then there are two more. Uh, one is about distinguishing panic buying from longer term patterns. And we, we talked earlier about you know, buying toilet paper, that kind of thing. So those are seem clearly like panic buying, but there are more longer ones like maybe confinement related ones like the baking products, you know, et cetera. And so the question is you know, what will, will remain there in the future? And the, the final question that are really conjunctural is how typical it will be to recover for supply chains recovers. And then we have more structure, uh, and I'll say long-term questions that are more related to uh, you know, what's gonna happen in the future. And those are the ones we may think, have to think a bit more because we have time to think about those. The first one is, you know, how will the management of global supply chains be likely to change? Uh, now, we, now we know, we can say that basically we knew before that th those pandemics were possible. We decided to ignore them collectively. You know, Decided. We saw that coming, but nobody wanted to, to look at that in detail. But now we know this is here. We know that the virus can mutate. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? And we definitely know that governments, they have very strict policies now in terms of securing population um, health. So you now, how can we take that into consideration in the management of supply chains? Um, a second question that come again from that session is, to what extent is this likely to reinforce digitalization and home delivery? Um, many, and we'll look at those two points today in more detail. And then uh, further questions about you know, uh, globalization. Will that put a stop uh, or reduce the globalization? Many people question the idea about, you know, given that everything is down, is it worth to building things back again in a better way, okay, um, from an environmental perspective? Um, and final point, an important one, is the question about what long-term lessons we want to have for the medical and the food supply chains. I think those two supply chains are supply chains that even if everything goes back to normal next month, we will still want to rethink those two supply chains about what do we do uh, with them in the future? How would we redesign them? <laughs> so these are very important. I'll say the main questions we can find out about what people are uh, considering today. Okay, um, and so it, from those big questions, we, we can first of all rethink um, what we call the double performance framework for supply chains. And it's just a first part about those things. Of course, there's much more to, to, to rethink. Um, but when we are designing supply chains, a very, very common performance framework is the SCORE model. Everyone knows the SCORE model. Everyone who did a little bit of supply chain know them. Um, and the SCORE model has you know, internal facing attributes, which is the cost. You know, when I'm looking to supply chain, I look at the cost of my supply chain and the service I'm providing. Um, and the cost is a very, very common um, attribute is the actual cost itself and cost of goods sold, 
cost, cost to serve, but also the asset management efficiency, basically my inventories. Okay, so I need to run a spare chain that is uh, cost effective, but also with very little inventory for this cost money. Uh, and this is a, a trade-off, which is on the other side, my service. And when I'm talking about service, I'm talking about my reliability. You know, uh, am I able to deliver exactly what I want uh, as promised, you know, my on-time info delivery rate? Um, the responsiveness, how quick I can deliver my products, is it a three-day delivery or an next day delivery? And finally, the last one, and the last one that usually in supply chain design, I've, I've, been, I've worked with supply chain for years, this one tended to be left a little bit aside. When we talk about supply chain, we talk about cost, about inventories, about responsiveness, reliability. This last one, agility, was something that we used to talk about among academics quite often, but in industry, it was maybe less um, seen as crucial. Um, and what is agility about? So let's have a quick look here at this uh, agility framework. Um, from the score perspective, when we are talking about agility, the first point uh, that we address is the overvalue at risk. What's the overvalue at risk? Is basically when I look at my sales, I have to map all my risks um, and multiply the, you know, the, the, take all my probability of risks events and multiply it by the impact of those risks. Basically, it's the outcome, the natural outcome of a business continuity plan. Okay, so what we have here, um, and the first point we may want to revisit here is most companies do business continuity plans. So the overvalue at risk, maybe companies don't, don't, don't have that on a regular basis, but they do that once in a while. Uh, but usually we address risks uh, as if they were independent. Okay, if my warehouse burns here, if my supplier dares come out, uh, but we don't never look at correlator risks. And maybe the first change we might have to think here is, okay, when I'm thinking about the, my business continuity, what about the correlation between risks? Is this something, uh, probably something people have to look in more detail that we're not looking now. We're looking at risks as if they were independent. Um, and then there is um, what SCORE calls the flexibility in their definition, okay? In this case, upside spectrum flexibility, which is the ability for them to achieve an unplanned and sustainable increase in demand. And they put, there as a 20% increase, okay? Now, we are flexible if we can reach plus 20% uh, increase in a number of days, in a limited number of days. Um, and then we have what they call the adaptability of supply chains, which is uh, <clears throat> the maximum increase in production that can achieve within 30 days. Okay, so that's the current framework. And that's a framework that makes sense, okay, for, for many people. And even today, we, we, we feel that, okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, what we might want to revisit here are those numbers, plus 20%, a change within 30 days. Okay, um, why? Well, basically, what we have here is some of the changes we've seen recently. Okay, uh, Amazon in the U.S. and had to hire uh, in, 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 in they made two announcements in less than a month. Uh, a, saying that they're going to hire 100,000 more people and then 70,000, 75,000 more, okay, following COVID-19. It's more, it's just that, it's more than 20% increase in, in, the, in the staff, not, not even the activity, okay? And to, to, to say how critical this is, uh, is basically that, you know, they, they're even in, increasing the pay rate for, for staff you know, from 15 to 17 dollars per hour. Uh, and the overtime is doubled. So that's, that probably shows how serious the situation is but, and how, how important that is for them. Um, GD.com in China announced a 215% year on year increase. Okay, and Ocado in the UK, which we're gonna see a bit later, uh, plus 40% of retail sales. So all those numbers show that you know, what we had, just the plus 20% within 30 days, uh, it's not at all what we had here. Okay, we, we, we go into things that are much higher than that. Uh, and, and, even, and even higher than what has been predicted by the World Economic Forum that said, oh, we should have a 10% growth per annum increase in, in uh, e-groceries now worldwide. Well, we've seen that much more than that happening in a very, very uh, short amount of time, okay? So the intensity is much higher. Um, and this over had had even <coughs> lead the, the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, though 
I have some concerns about you know, how can we make every, everybody be on board uh, of that um, of that new digital world, okay? Because that's what we we, we seem to be going to. Um, so that's you know, something I have to revisit this actually later. So let's talk now just about two examples. Uh, one very recent about you know, flexibility and automation, uh, and uh, another more uh, a bit older. So the first one is you now what have we seen when we went shopping? So this is Tesco's. You probably have seen that before. Uh, so Tesco's they they pick you know in shops they have 90% of their orders that are picked by hand in their in 350 stores. Um, uh, and what we we've seen with them is that um, when the crisis arrived their delivery sorts look like this, okay? Basically, there was not, not much you can do. You could not order anything. The website was working, but they didn't have capacity to deliver. The physical infrastructure wasn't there to satisfy the demand, okay? However, over time, right, we've uh, seen slots being delivered, okay? It took a while, but that happened. And um, even now, I, mean, I've been, I went there, I think, a couple of days ago, you know, we can, you can still order products for the next week. It's not anymore a next day delivery, but you're still there next week, you can have something uh, in your product. Uh, and they've done so by basically uh, closing their shops in the evening and putting a lot of online delivery and preparation in the evening times. Okay, so they, they've dedicated all the, most of the 250 shops to, to evening deliveries. Um, and, um, and that has kind of worked quite well because they have this, that, this infrastructure available to deliver things. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have the example of Ocado, uh, which is a pure player, you know, digital um, company. So uh, Ocado is a, uh, I'll say a British success story. So again, we, we're gonna show here something that didn't, went well for them, but overall they have a very good story. You see uh, in the chart, you know, the, um, the stock market value between Tesco's you know, in black and, and orange is Ocado. So they, they really grew a lot. Um, they, they, they were created in 2002, where they started managing the e-grocery um, for uh, Waitrose and then expanded to John Lewis. And in 2015, they kind of switched the, the model. They've created a Ocado smart platform where they basically decided our job is to sell technology for other providers now, and, and we are going to manage to do the e-groceries for them. Now we're going we're gonna to be their, their platform, the smart platform for, for grocery. And that, that, and they had their first clients in 2017 and 18 in France, Canada, US, and that's when the market share soared. Okay, and how do they work? Well, they have those very automatized warehouses. Uh, you can see here some robots, you know, that looks like the Amazon robots, you know, they, they tend to lift uh, shelves from the bottom. Those are robots that walk on top, but that's the idea, that's the, the principle of uh, having goods to man instead of man to good. Okay, and even some robots available here to pick products. And so what happened to them? When this, we had this increase in demand, if you went to their, uh, to their uh, website, well, you started seeing things you don't really like to see as a client, okay? Um, and even you know, recently, uh, I've been there and basically say, no, uh, the, the, the website is shut down. So they didn't have the capacity to, um, to follow that demand. Uh, because basically they didn't have the infrastructure for that. Um, and they actually, um, there have been a, a precedent with them uh, in terms of you know, product with capacity, uh, which was um, a fire they had in their warehouse in 2019. Okay, so they kind of knew uh, how, how, what a business continuity plan was. No, it's not, it's, it wasn't something they haven't seen before because they had a fire in one of their warehouse representing 10% of the capacity went on fire. And so um, basically, but what they've learned there and maybe more even specifically here is that automation, which is something that follows digitalization and is something important, has some issues that need to be considered, okay? Uh, and the first one of them is that it's difficult to, to function out of the design values of your system, regardless of how broad the branch is. Now, you, you can have a, a system with design values quite broad, but as, when you leave the, that branch, things get really, really difficult to manage, okay? Also, when we, we go towards uh, this automation, uh, you, know, you tend to have a higher concentration of production assets. Instead of having several shops, you have a few 
big warehouse is very uh, automated and therefore a bigger concentration of your risks okay in a very few expensive facilities and when you have problem and troubles okay usually the environment is not designed for human intervention so it's very difficult to you know to do something when you have a, a, a disaster happening um, and so the whole question maybe that we have to think here about you know automation is this trade-off between you know, the, the cost effectiveness, you know, it's very effective to, to have a, a big to those systems, of course, like a typical warehouse productivity can be you know, 60 to 120 picks per hour. With those machines, it can go well beyond 200 picks per hour. So there is productivity. Uh, but if we want, how can we combine this productivity with flexibility or making things work out of their uh, nominal uh, values? Okay, when the situation have can we afford that and that's an issue we don't have a full answer yet but that's something that we think about okay um and then um uh, my last example happened a while ago again where you know you were thinking about digital uh, construction um and uh at Renault we have learned something from, from nissan um when I, I was younger we were building um, a you know, system to build what we call a digital factory, 3D digital factory. Could, you, know, you could build your factory uh, and see if the factory would work well uh, as expected before you implement a new product, before you know, put a new product in your assembly line, you make a simulation to check if everything is fine. Uh, and that's where our vision. Uh, in 99, Renault bought Nissan, you all know the story. Um, and we knew that they were more effective than we were in their systems. They, they were much more effective. In the their high productivity. Even today, Sunderland is one of the most productive automotive plants in Europe. Uh, and when we started talking to them, we saw that what they showed us as their tools for productivity didn't look at all like the ones we were working on. Basically, we were basic sheets of paper. And that raised questions to us about what, how those things work. So what we were doing, basically, is now trying to implement a digital copy of an assembly line um, use operation plans database, you know, the bill of materials from the information system, we pulled that from there, the bill of operations from the operation system, we pulled, everything was built automatically in a uh, discrete event simulator, and then we could you know, see the operators walking around the vehicles, making sure that they were not bumping into each other, optimizing their movements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, but we knew that you know, we had to look at what Nissan was doing because you know, they were more productive. Um, you probably heard about the Japanese production systems, lean management approaches. Um, and uh, in lean management approaches, you know, some of those principles are really from Toyota, like Kanban, suggestion boxes, you know, the idea of having project leaders. You know, Toyota implemented them very early, Nissan and Renault implemented them a bit later. Um, but and some of those lean management principles are really, I would say, Japanese because Toyota and Nissan implemented them very early, both of them. Know, they made deals with unions, I mean, deals, uh, uh, they really crushed the unions. Uh, um, <clears throat> um, they implemented total quality methods and they implemented the standard operation principle very early. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here. I mean, the standard operation is something that Renault implemented uh, when, that, uh, when they purchased Nissan. And this is what had an impact on what we were doing. So how the system worked in Nissan to design new production systems? And, flexible enough, okay? As a reminder, they were, when they implemented a new car in the production system, they were able to roll out this new car in less than six months. And the, you know, the productivity rates raised very quickly to optimal rates. Within at Renault, it took longer time to put this new car and reach very good productivity rates at the time. And the system they worked was quite simple. They had a computer-aided design used, using computers, you know, and then the industrial engineering teams had what we call a process control chart. Okay, who ensure the order of assembly of your products in the assembly line. <clears throat> and they have a process operation sheet, which is basically an IKEA sheet telling you how to assemble the product. That's all they have. One piece of paper was the IKEA-like sheet, and the other one was a process saying in what order do those parts had to be assembled in the assembly line. And that's all the industrial engineering teams used to do. And then the, and then the actual, operate, um, the actual um, bill of operations was carried out in the production uh, factories, okay, with what we, they call their, their standard operation sheet. 
Okay, very different from what we used to see in Hondo. So what were the two design principles that they had that ensured that, you know, that high flexibility in terms of the capacity to uh, take on new cars in a very, in a quicker rate than we, that people did at Renault. The first one is a process control chart. Okay, actually, first principle, keeping the product design under control. With the process control chart, you know, you can see that in one section, they have maybe 40, 50, 50 points where they ensure that independently independent of the car you have, the assembly orders will be following a certain order. So the design is, was, we were in a sort of design to manufacture constraints, okay? Whereas in Renault, that wasn't the case. Okay, we had really big ideas of, okay, we should assemble this here, this there, but there was much more flexibility from design to change the assembly operations, okay? Uh, but that flexibility in the design principles had as a consequence a lower capacity for the assembly plants to, to take on board those changes. And the second principle is keeping the workshop involved. So when you're designing production systems, okay, as you can see in this image, so um, we start the product design at the bottom left here of this chart, um, and then you have to define the assembly operations specifications, your IT sheet if you want, um, and then you have to design your bill of operations. And on that stage, uh, you have a split between, you know, on our side, Renault, we kept a lot of this work being done by engineering teams, um, and Nissan, who went down to the production teams. And why? Well, because Renault kept their kind of digital design approach requiring you know, engineering teams and more centralized effort, while at Nissan, because this was very simple, uh, uh, it was carried out by the production department. Okay, a more hands-on production system design. Okay, so um, what is important here to notice is that Although we can say Nissan had more productive and you know, the human aspect was things were carried out by hand, it's, it's, there's also an, uh, a relation to the product design. The product was designed to fit better the production system. Okay, so it's, it's a flexibility in to take new cars that has, of course, um, as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a, a first need, well, the fact that, that we have a car well designed. Okay, just so a final words. Um, uh, so um, an important thing is when you are designing processes, okay, uh, the requirements are not always equal, the, the final design, okay? They depend on the flexibility of the process that has been designed. So, um, and this flexibility will be defined by the complexity and the uncertainty that the production system or distribution system is submitted to. Okay, so when we have a, a uh, system that under a strong commercial uncertainty, okay, um, then the process needs to be redesigned on a, on a weekly basis, okay? Um, and also the more uncertain, the more very often human resources are required, okay? Uh, so what does this bring for automation and digitalization challenges? Well, the first one is you now more flexibility as always. So this capacity to say, okay, we have to go towards more and more flexibility because that's what people need. Also, uh, another point that we may think about is how to work with downgraded modes. Now, when things are out of specification or out of you know, the expected values, what do we do? How, how do we work? Uh, and how can we create human interaction? Now, how can we do things where, with an appropriate human interaction between the, the people and the machine? Okay, uh, how can I interfere? Can I still work? Can people work on those machines in a downgraded mode, et cetera, et cetera, okay? While, of course, keeping this flexibility insurance premium low enough. So can we still uh, put this, have this extra flexibility while keeping the resulting costs low? Okay, and that's also a problem because when we do automation, we tend to put things very, very compacted way, at least in, in warehouses, for example, to save on, on square meters on the floor. But if we do that, people cannot go into the system to, inter, to, put, to intervene. So, would you like to create more space so people can go there, but for that we have to pay an extra cost. So this is basically future challenges to come for, I suppose, this sector. Thanks very much uh, for your time and patience, and I'll, I'll stay here until the end for further questions you have. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen to let the next panelist.
Thank you so much for that. That was really great. I really enjoyed it. Um, You're welcome. I, I have to say, Siemens, um, ourselves, he's digital twin, uh, very effectively in our Congleton factory just recently in redesigning the floors so that we could maintain social distancing and just looking at how production lines need to be re-engineered to ensure, as you said and highlighted, and I know it's a really, really important thing for us in Siemens, is that protecting people first yeah. so that we can go into the workplace, we can keep production going, ramp production back up while maintaining social distancing. So Digital Twin and the technology there worked really, really effectively. But as you said also, the importance of the, the value of people in maintaining flexibility and that agility. Yes, yeah. well. It, it yeah. is a, a work that has to be carried on together and even it's even more crucial now probably. Yes, so I, it was a really great presentation and it teases up so nicely for our next presentation in terms of just having given us that overview of um, what had happened in Tesco and Ocado, but also within the manufacturing environment. I am very, very pleased that our next speaker, and I'm going to stick to the original running order. I know we talked, but I think, I think Dirk is all sorted. So I am going to quickly hand over to our next speaker, Dr. Dirk Worth, Managing and Scientific Director of AWS Institute for Digitized Products and Processes. So um, over to you, Dirk. I think if you're ready to take over the screen, I'll just put myself back on silent and take myself off the video. Can you or, hear me? Or not, as the case may be. Dirk, are you there? We've got you? Yes. No, I hear you. The screen is all yeah, yours. Yeah, I don't know what is happening. It's it's coming up and down. We will try as much as we can, and we will see. And now it seems okay for you too? Yep. That's perfect. Okay. We can hear you great. Thank you. Perfect. So, I'll try to share my screen. So probably you see, or I hope you see the screen. Yeah, we can see it fine, Dirk, thanks. Okay. Perfect. So then let's start. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here, at least virtually, um, and to give you, uh, to share some of my thoughts um, with you. Actually, two days ago, um, Facebook announced that they will enter the retail market. Uh, what more precisely what they said is that they are going to offer possibilities um, for uh, different small uh, enterprises, for small shop owners to open in both platforms, uh, Facebook as well as on Instagram, the possibility to open uh, sub shops um, on these platforms and to provide their goods and to provide the fulfillment. Even so, it was the kind of uh, triggered by uh, Corona, and that was the official um, reasoning why to, to go into this step. Um, this is obviously something um, that this uh, company has planned already for several years, and um, the current situation was just uh, the possibility uh, or, the, or the, the reasoning to do it at that very moment. But this means actually, and this is a good indication that what we are facing is um, some huge developments that change in, in retail industry due to digitization. Um, now and over the next, um, probably next years, probably the next decade. Um, and um, from my perspective, what I see is that Corona very much um, catalyzes that uh, Corona very much increases certain um, trends and certain developments that we see. And actually that's what for today I would like to, to talk about and give you some insights uh, from my perspective, um, both on the, on the current situation in digitizing retail um, as well as what are the technological implications and prerequisites that are uh, correlated with this. Just to give you an idea, so um, I'm Dirk Wirt. I'm the CEO of the AWSI, of the August Film Share Institute. And uh, just to give you a quick note, um, quick insights, we are actually a private nonprofit research facility located in Germany. 
um, and what we are doing is mainly in the interdisciplinary cross industry digitization research. So we are focusing on a, on a bunch of different um, industries. Retail obviously is one of them, but there are, there are a lot of other services industries, service providers, uh, classical manufacturing industry, and so on. And what we aim is on the one hand uh, to work on our vision of what we call a super smart enterprise. That's a bit our vision of how businesses will look like in the target uh, range of 2035. So some of the things that I want um, to introduce to you today is exactly about that. What are our uh, whole thinking concepts uh, based on this uh, based on, on, on our insights. Um, but as well, we are not um, intending just to do uh, research, but we have the very deep intention also to put it into marketable uh, products, which then obviously are not offered by us because we are a nonprofit uh, center. Uh, however, with our partners, with uh, our network, with our ecosystem, um, and that is what we want to do. And uh, we are currently in, in several um, uh, action streams very far on this. Um, even though we are we are quite a young organization, we were founded in uh, 2015, and from there we we grow up about we doubled uh, our size and our operational. Um, uh, uh, revenues uh, every year, uh, and even this year, even uh, facing Corona, um, I expect that we will grow also in 2020 about 40 to 50 percent. Um, so uh, that's something uh, where you see uh, that this topic has a huge impact. And just as a personal note, what we can see is um, what Corona did, also in the German. Um, industry with, with our customers um, uh, is that um, they were postponing a lot of project in the last month, but in, for the next, for the last two weeks, uh, things ramp up very quickly. Uh, so this week I got three new orders from things that were um, on a fast lane um, in order, uh, and that's in general something that you can observe that uh, all the topics that are around digital solutions, um, they will come up out of the, the current crisis, out of the, the situation in a, in a very much stronger way that we, we entered it before. Um, and it, it's the same actually for us. When you look at what means digitization, and that's um, a bit how I see the digitization world. We are currently facing like what I call four waves, which are more phases um, with specific topics what we are talking about. The first, and there we are mostly done with it, um, is about automation and virtualization. So um, when you look in the last 10 years, most of the projects are about automating things, transferring tasks from um, man uh, from uh, persons, from humans uh, to machinery. Um, and uh, that's a very, very huge topic that we were facing. What currently starts to become a hot topic uh, maybe one, two years ago was uh, what I call digital interface and cooperation. So digital solutions that facilitate um, the interaction between humans between organizations, between um, human and uh, machines. Um, this is certainly something that will have a lot of potential, not just by um, automating things, so keeping things as they are, but just um, putting the execution um, into um, some automated box, whatever it is, it depends on, on the sector, um, but to come up with, with new ways of processing. I will come up with some, um, some examples a bit later on. Um, and uh, what we see in the next future with a perspective for five to 10 years is that also products change. They get more and more uh, digitized. Uh, we also heard this, this example about a digital twin, uh, which you can uh, apply both on 
uh, product facilities. Very nice examples of what's going on. Hi, Dirk, we seem to have lost you there for a moment. We'll just, we'll just give you a chance to come back online. Maybe it's just me. No, not just you, Joe. I lived in hope. Was it dropped out? Oh, you dropped out, but you're back. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, excuse me. I don't know what this is. Um, I will copy. You give me a, a little sign when, when you don't understand, you hear me, then, then I can revert. Who's that? Um, and the same obviously also applies to retail industry. Uh, when, uh, and you can give some very prominent examples on this. For example, when you look at this e commerce hype that we had the last 10 years with uh, prominent um, market participants that raised up by this, uh, make and shop, it's like it's like a automated uh, automated uh, shopping store at the end of the day, um, and you can you can look at many examples that apply to this. And what's upcoming, if you, for example, look at conversational interfaces or what what is also called like conversational shopping experiences uh, that is currently discussed, and Amazon was one of the first mover in this part. Uh, where you where you use your voice in order to, to place orders to to um, um, direct the ways you are you are making your shopping experience on both ways. I mean, putting it but also getting feedback. Uh, that's certainly something uh, that is a good example for these digital interfaces. But just as a as a, um, a short note, so this applies also to um, to the retail sector. But what is very interesting is we also have the upcoming trend that you probably always know that the online and the offline sector try to merge um, more or less. Obviously, um, because of the success of the online, online sector, um, most classical retailers are forced to go online, mainly via online stores. Um, but also the, the large um, uh, online players, uh, they start um, entering the brick and mortar uh, domain. Even so, maybe a bit in, in an experiment, experimental setting, because if you think here is the example of Amazon Go with uh, flex store stores in uh, Seattle and over some, some other um, uh, cities in the US. However, um, you cannot say that Amazon is very clearly and uh, decisively going into this market because if they would want to, uh, they would have the uh, the means to uh, simply acquire one of the large uh, retailers, notably uh, Walmart. Um, they could even pay it out of their cash uh, without even having to any any financing instruments, but they did not. So uh, they, they they try it out. They go into this direction. Um, but I think what is the the general scheme that we are entering a world where these these two sectors subsectors are very much merging. What I said till now actually is not very new, um, and is not something that has to do with Corona. So what is the effect of Corona? Well, we can look at it, what it means um, in terms of effect. Um, here on the stock prices, but the stock prices usually is a kind of a, of a promise on the future of enterprise. And what is very not noticeable, and I think that's also very interesting to see, is that um, we already had what I call the digital business divide. So um, that the degree of um, of, um, of enterprise success is splitting into the company of the non-digital companies and the digital companies. The obvious uh, examples that you can see is um, how um, a car manufacturer like Tesla is. Uh, 
is uh, capitalized uh, compared to some classical um, automotive company like Mercedes, Volkswagen, or whatever you take, um, uh, GM. And what we see here, which is very interesting, I would say, is that mainly the, the classical industries have had a huge loss in value due to the corona crisis whereas um the digital um the digital companies including the digital retailers um they have gained value over the crisis even so they lost um they lost revenues it's not that uh, the turnover is the same. Actually, if you look at the numbers, the turnover even decreased for those, uh, for those, uh, for Amazon or for others, um, in total. But the value increased. So that's what I initially said. What, what we can observe is uh, that this discrepancy between, um, well, let's call it the old world and the new world, um, under the influence of Corona, has even um, increased dramatically. Um, and I think that this will even increase in a few years. Um, but the question is, is this something um, that is unevitable? So uh, is something that cannot be changed? And what I want to give you um, uh, in, the, in the next minute is uh, that Hi, Dirk. It's Michael here. You've dropped out again, I'm afraid. Dirk, can you hear us? No, I can hear you again. You can hear us. Okay, and you're back. Okay, perfect. Uh, you see my screen still, or I need to reconnect it? No, you need to share your screen again. We can see okay. you. There you go. Something. Yes. Okay. So um, you... my last words were about that. Um, is this situation that we are currently observing that is even um, uh, introduced or, or um, uh, facilitated by the by the Corona crisis? Is it um, inevitable? And I will give you. Some of uh, what I think um, we, what we observe currently is a very much a shift in all industries, but I, I will stick on the, on, the, on the retail industry. I could also give you some other very nice examples, but I will stick on the retail industry. So um, one example that I want to give you is from a wine retailer here in Germany that obviously had a very stationary uh, business. So people go there, they buy wines. Um, and they also make like wine tastings as a kind of sales promotion um, activity and well, they were quite successful. So what they did as a kind of what I call the pre-corona digital retailing. So already a few years ago, they introduced the online shop. So you can also order wines online, um, but obviously, especially with a good like wine where, where taste and uh, different characteristics are important. Um, this was not the, the huge, the, the biggest success, especially um, because you cannot, um, at least till now, uh, you cannot describe the taste of a wine precisely um, in a digital solution. So what I did currently um, is they changed a bit the setting. So because of Corona, they were not able to to uh, host the standard uh, wine tastings. So they made it online. And what they did actually is, so they, they sent a packet of selected wines to their customers that wanted to attend to this kind of um, uh, wine tasting. Um, and they make like a video event like we are doing today without wines. I mean, I don't have, maybe you have. Um, you see there the picture also um, how this looks like. But also he, or they invited uh, the winemaker to this session. Um, and it was not the, the sales rep that was uh, presenting the different wines and explaining about the things about it. It was the, uh, the original winemaker in himself. And I think that's a very nice example of what means uh, real digitization. It's not just replicating what, how the process was before and to make it in a, in a new step, 
So like if you have the wine in a shelf or in an electronic shelf, like an like a, 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 like online shop, mainly it's more or less the same process. But here you try to, uh, to, to get the, the profits, the um, benefits from an electronic solution. So um, in the original event, it was not possible to fly in the winemaker. Um, and it was always limited to a certain amount, I think to 10 or something like that, uh, people. Here, this event was widespread. I think on the last, there were like more than 40 people attending. Uh, you have a very much, you, you transform it into a experience. Um, and as a side note, um, you don't need to drive home because you're already home, which helps in a, in a wine tasting um, a lot. So, and I think from this kind of examples, we will in the future, um, see and uh, learn about them a lot because they are really shifting and trying um, to put the advantages of digital solutions in upfront. We see it also in, in other directions. If we look at what's the main difference and what's the big advantage of online um, retail companies compared to their offline uh, correspondents is Mainly, they can they can drive their business based on a on a, on a data um, analysis tasks. So, if you look at the typical um, online retailers, obviously you have a lot of online trends, uh, online analytics that you can run, which means you have a, a logging of the transactions. This is the same. This you can up to a certain point replicate also in the offline world, um, because at a part of sales. Um, you can see what's what's uh, at, the, at the receipt and try to to make their account list. But you can also see what's the product interest, which pages um, he can he clicks in what order for what purpose for what uh, what leads to a buy and what does not lead to a buying decision. Um, and finally, um, that's not something that is too much um, talked about in public. But there were also some very nice research results that show uh, that this is uh, technically possible and also uh, feasible. You can make like general behavior. You can you can analyze general behaviors um, up to moods and certain other things that were um, derived from your from your activities, from your mouse movements and so on. So this leads mainly to to very um, to a very um, full possibility uh, to profile your customer. Um, and uh, some say that uh, Amazon knows their customers better than their, their husbands or their wives. Um, that may be in, in some cases the, the case, but it's a big business value. Um, and uh, so the, the obvious thing is what you see is that the product recommendations um, that are generated by mostly all successful um, online retailers at the moment. Um, and those recommendations contribute to the revenue up to uh, 30%. Um, so just this functionality increases the, the, the turnover of the, uh, the sales volume by about 30%, a bit more, the, 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 the rough number, uh, which is huge uh, compared to the, to the classical um, offline store. And what you can do and what also some of the onlineers are already ex at least experimenting with is sales forecasting, so you get the goods. Uh, well, that's the future. That's not happening till now that you get goods uh, before you order them. Um, however, what is already happening at the moment is on the supply chain side that the inventories are filled based on sales forecasts so that the goods are already, um, that the, the goods that are forecasted that you will order them soon uh, will be shipped to some nearby inventory to be able to uh, replenish them uh, very quickly to your to your store. So that's for to know for the online store. So the question is, can you replicate this also in the offline store? Um, and actually that's, that's one of our research uh, topics where we are working on in one of the projects is one major also retailer here in Germany. Um, what we call the offline uh, retail recommender, which mainly means that you try to track and you replicate 
the same data sets that you are very successfully collecting in the online world, um, also in some typical uh, warehouse settings uh, here, for example, in the grocery store or whatever. Uh, so obviously the input and the output um, possibilities are different. Um, you can try to capture persons by cameras, by positioning devices. Um, there are some other like intelligent shelves or, or different uh, combination uh, possibilities. And the outputs, like recommendations, uh, there are also different. You can have uh, displays on your um, on your shopping cart. There are maybe stationary displays um, within the facility. There might be some other intelligent like uh, push push messaging on, on the mobile phones, etc. Um, but the principle, and that's important thing, uh, mainly is the same. And just to give you a, a quick um, indication how this looks like, that's actually one of the uh, results. And it's um, in the, this is real data from real persons. Um, obviously, anonym, uh, anonym, anonymous. Uh, otherwise, I could not show it to you. Um, but those are real data. This is the this is the store. Um, it's a it's a large grocery store uh, where you see how people move, um, and you can then very deeply analyze where they are, what they looked at, how much time they spent in which area, and if they maybe behave in a non-normal setting. Um, so if they um, behave different than all the other um, customers, which also can give you an indication of maybe there there is a, a fraud ongoing or, or there are some other scenarios that, that are possible for this. So this also leads to this, um, like, uh, providing kind of same instruments uh, for both what is currently very successful in the online store to also uh, replicate this in, in, a, in a brick and mortar um, environment. And it shows also um, what technology, what's currently the role of technology. Because in the, in the classical setting, and I will with this also come, come to the end of my of my talk. Um, in the classical setting, so this is uh, textbook knowledge. What we see is um, you have the technology that, that enables the um, operational level and that leads to new business models and vice versa. You have the, the driving experience. Um, I say this was valid for, for a long time, but what I observe currently is that mostly you skip this operational level. So what we see at the moment is that current uh, technology directly um, drives new business models um, and that the, the question of how these things are um, put in operations um, goes in the second line. It's not so important any longer, especially because also this um, operational level is something uh, that changes quite quickly. I will give you this for this other uh, quick example, also from what we are currently um, working in our labs uh, on the possibility how you can evolve uh, retailing in the future. Um, and obviously, this is a setting with some um, mixed reality uh, glasses, in this case, uh, Microsoft HoloLens 2. Um, but it changes the business models because um, if you uh, quickly start it, um, the difference is that there is no longer the need for the um, for the shopping facility itself. So um, it is a shopping that is like attached to physical objects that you see that you have at home anyway. I mean, like, like what we saw here, but the same as for what we have in the, um, uh, what, when, what we have when you see it everywhere. Which closes a bit the loop. So I started with, with this example of, of Facebook. Um, I think it's very remarkable 
first because of the, the things that are initially said, because they're entering a new market. And um, imagine uh, that Hilton is announcing that they now start producing furniture um, in, instead of uh, providing um, hotel services. And what we see here is the same. And uh, when those large digital companies enter a new market segment, it usually leads to very quick and significant changes in the market. I want to close with, a, with an example uh, for you. So uh, what do you think, who is the, uh, by revenue, the largest watches manufacturer in the world? I think you cannot answer. Um, it's Apple, obviously, uh, with the Apple Watch. And uh, watchmaking is a, in, uh, a long traditional industry with a history of, I don't know, 200 years, 250 years. Um, and the uh, Apple Watch was introduced in the market five years ago. So in five years, um, they completely disrupted the market. Um, becoming the um, by by revenue um, the biggest watch manufacturer in the world. So I think what we will observe will be a lot of surprises, um, also for retail industry. Um, and I'm not sure that the forecasts that are currently doing, also like um, everything will be online and everything will be replicated, will be true because we see also a lot of. Um, a technological but also business driven approaches also to uh, weaponize the, the brick and mortar uh, companies and uh, what I know at least from Germany is there are a lot of activities ongoing also to catch up this way. So for this I uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think I'm a few minutes over time um, but anyways thank you very much uh, and um, yeah, I think later on we will have a, a quick discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, and I'm glad you finished on the point of watches. We are a little over time. I don't think it was just you, though. I think it was all of us. We were cumulatively a little behind schedule. We're, in fact, we're completely behind schedule. And that just shows how we behave differently online to how we do in person. Because anyone who knows me from facilitating events in the real world, I'd have jumped up and grabbed the microphone from people or given them evil looks if they were running over. So um, I'm, I'm clearly far more polite when I'm on, online. And I am looking at my a very physical watch and keen to hand over to our next speaker. But actually that ties in so beautifully because your examples there were very much on the retail sector. Um, I started my own career in retail, actually. I started with Woolworths and the Kingfisher Group in London. So this oh, nice. is a, a topic very close to my heart. And, uh, and very close, I am sure, to the heart of our next speaker, who is John Shaw, the CIO of Primeline, who I am very sure are right in the mix and the cut and thrust of all that has been happening in Ireland in logistics over the last couple of months. So really looking forward to hear what John has got to say. His slide is up on screen already. So I'm just going to disappear off here again and uh, hand over to John. Thank you very much. Thank you. And can everybody hear me okay? Perfectly, Crystal. Brilliant. Okay, so, um, so I'm conscious that time is precious, but I will uh, try to stick to the allotted time of 20 minutes. So um, I'm the CIO at Primeline. My colleague, uh, who's our CTO, Javantica, was going to also uh, join our call, but unfortunately, due to other business pressures, has not been able to join. Um, I have a long association with the Innovation Value Institute, stretching back to its very early days. And in successive organizations, I've worked with the team. Um, so I'm going to talk about Primeline and the effect COVID has had on our business. But I'm going to talk about that with a little bit of macroeconomics and a little bit of microeconomics, a little bit of technology, a little, and a few anecdotes along the way. But I want to leave you with three key messages. Um, the world we're in now is the new normal. There is no going back. You know, um, it's, we've moved on and we're, you know, the, the stone age didn't end because people ran out of stones, you know, things move on. Okay. Uh, in this new normal, um, the majority of people will work from home forever. Organizations like Twitter have said that it's going to be okay to work at home in Twitter forever. 
many organizations are saying that it'll become for those organizations that were historically uncomfortable with the concept it's the new norm and um, equally our ecosystems our suppliers our customers our partners our trusted confidants or expert for opinion formers we can largely assume they will interact with us in a similar way from home and the number one priority in each and every one of our lives is now our health our hygiene our diet we've all become experts on vitamin d hydration hygiene two meter distance sneeze into your sleeve get other people to sneeze into their sneeze get other people to sneeze into their sleeve rather they can sneeze into their sneeze too if they wish um covid19 is a time machine you think that today is the 21st of May 2020. You are wrong. Today is the 21st of May 2025. We have been catapulted five years into the future. The timeline to achieve digital disruption on, on a massive scale has been, the timeline has collapsed and it's now, we're in there. We're, we're live and running. And every business, whether it knew it or not, has been a digital business for quite some time. But in this new world that we're in, the customer, the supplier, the colleague, everyone expects always on, simple, fast, accurate, secure, responsive, and now. And if you cannot do all of that, you get elbowed out of the way and the other guy gets the business, the relationship, the future. Simple as that. No prisoners, no excuses. Welcome to 2025. So I'll talk about uh, PrimeLine by going through it in this way. You know, as I said, a little bit of macroeconomics to begin with. So if we start by looking at um, what has COVID-19 revealed? Well, it's revealed a lot. It's revealed who was ready, who plans ahead, who can think on their feet, and who can do joined up thinking. With instant news and instant communication and instant access to the facts, comparisons are, can be rapidly drawn between each of us and our nearest competitor, between our company and another company, or our, our sector and other sector, our country and other country, et cetera. Um, in this digital age, everyone can find out everything for themselves. And COVID-19 is feeding an insatiable demand for facts, for decisions, and for action. We want our government to be like Taiwan's government, right? We all, in every country, want our government to be like Taiwan's government, where only seven people out of a population of 24 million have succumbed to COVID-19. We like what's happened in New Zealand. Greece, which people always uh, uh, laughed at, only 166 people have died in Greece. Finland, always a beacon of uh, excellence when it comes to innovation, only 304. So when we choose who to compare ourselves with, it is always wise to compare ourselves with the best. It can be comforting to compare ourselves with the weakest, but really, we really need to learn from the best in all aspects and all human endeavors. So in terms of digital disruption, um, this week, Microsoft announced their quantum computing platform is now accessible on, on Azure. Uh, three weeks ago, Amazon uh, activated their first warehouse in Ireland. Um, Jeff Bezos, since this all began, his personal fortune is up $24 billion. And we've all become expert on Zoom. Um, so trends that were already underway are accelerating. You know, the printer is finished. The office is finished. Business travel is finished. So if your business depends on those three things, you need a different business. Um, the consumer will exercise choice. We're getting into greater and greater, uh, you know, um, competitive uh, opportunities for everyone. And the, the consumer will always do what the consumer always does. The cheapest, easiest, fastest, simplest, and most secure option in technology will always win. Um, quantum computing has gone from being uh, theory five years ago to this year, a $500 million business. And within a decade, a $64 billion business. And it's not just me saying that. If you, if, you, if you look into the research, it's quite incredible how this whole thing has certainly had one particular industry extremely, uh, and that is quantum computing. And when you look at Gartner's thinking on this, and it's one of, one of, one of the great thought leaders in our, in our technological world, they talk about 10 major uh, digital disruptions long before COVID. They talked about this. 
things that relate to in, in intelligent systems and greater uh, you know, insight and, and intu intuition, a greater degree of digitization, and a greater degree of meshing things together in, in, in the way that blockchain can do. So, you know, but the, 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 the big thing coming fast in the outside lane, which you're going to hear more and more of is quantum computing. Um, the arc of human progress. Um, as things connect up more and more and more, and this has been happening now for, since the dawn of the computer age in the 1960s, the price of everything asymptotically approaches zero. In fact, it approaches three things. It approaches free, perfect, and now, as per Robert, Robert Roden's book. Now, COVID has accelerated this. This was already happening. It's just gonna happen faster. So the world is, is, is ever more connected. We've never had as many smart people alive at the same time in the history of the human race. We've never had as many computers active or as many being built. Uh, the first quarter of this year was Intel's bu busiest ever quarter in their entire history. There is an insatiable demand accelerated by COVID. As people work from home and people demand answers and supply chains move towards what's called direct to consumer, D to C, direct to consumer. As this continues, more and more demand for, for data, for insight, for intelligence, pattern recognition, automation, it just accelerates and the price crashes. And you're, we, are, we are all in a race against our next best competitor to outmaneuver us with, with a better offering, faster, better, cheaper, simpler, or indeed free, free, perfect, and now. And by the way, just in, in, I know we're, we're, we're hosted by an, an academic institution, Maynooth University, but many of you probably already know this, but every lecture on every course in MIT is freely avail available in a searchable format on YouTube and has been for several years now. A frightening prospect that in education, free, perfect, and now is available from MIT. So it's not just in, in, the, in the commercial world, it's in academia, it's in public service, it's everywhere, this digitization. So to talk specifically about PrimeLine. So we are um, in business over 30 years. We have evolved from being a traditional warehousing and transport company to a business that works with over uh, 300 brands. So we are brand partners. And what that means, for example, with Mars, uh, to pick Mars as an example. Mars is the largest uh, food company in the world. In Ireland, the salespeople work for PrimeLine. So we are, we are providing the Mars organization with the sales management, order fulfillment, warehousing, transportation. Uh, the, we manage the full set of relationships with Mars customers in Ireland. We, we do this for over 300 brands in various ways, but Mars would be, would be the... Uh, the, the largest uh, with that particular model. Um, I know there's someone on, on, on the call from Japan, Shiseido, the um, beauty product range um, from Japan. We are, the, we are their partner in a similar way um, in Ireland. Many of the other brands here, those on the call may, may well rec recognize. So we have, uh, we have a range of capabilities that I've, that I've uh, mentioned. I won't read out every detail on every slide given the time limit but we do a huge amount of work helping brands develop their market share in Ireland. Uh, and then we provide the logistic support around that, that effort. So within our ecosystem then, if we step back and look at supply chain, long before COVID in supply chain, people would talk about risk. Maersk Shipping, one of the largest shipping companies in the world was taken offline, big Danish company, all over the world. You'll have, many of you would be familiar with the Maersk shipping containers that you'd have seen on, on trucks or at ports. They were taken offline because of a ransomware attack approximately three and a half years ago. They were, they were completely wiped out. Uh, it was a struggle to get back. They did it. They are now, they've gone from back of the pack to front of the pack. Um, their digital agenda which was sidelined and perhaps ignored, <clears throat> is now their central proposition. <clears throat> they have really transformed in this way. But cyber attacks remain a major, major issue. The second biggest one, which was in North America, there was a big labor dispute that ran on for several years on the west coast of the US. It disrupted supply chains all over the world. Maybe not prime line, but it was very disruptive. 
And of course, uh, in increasing storms like Hurricane Harvey back in 2017 was, was also very disruptive. The point is though that back 12 months ago or more, nobody was talking about pandemics, epidemics or diseases in any way as, as affecting um, supply chain. Nobody, certainly in Ireland, the debate was all about our concern over Brexit, but no one was talking about illness as something that could, that could massively disrupt our, our, our lives. Nobody was talking about a black swan event. But even when you look at some of the analysis around you know, forward looking, you know, what are the areas of increasing risk? So if you look at analysis like this here, where you're, where you're considering in five years time and five years ago, you know, what are the areas of consistent risk and what are the areas of you know, consistently high risk and areas of consistently low risk? So operational complexity has always been the thing that's seen to be the biggest risk in supply chain, with the notable exception of Amazon, of course. But the areas of increasing risk were things around regulatory compliance, the power of the consumer, computer security. But you'll see no one was thinking about, well, what about, what about an illness that, that would come along? Um, equally before COVID-19, just to take tourism um, as, as, as something, I mean, tourism is, is, is all about discretionary spend. And um, tourism globally, when you, when you consider international uh, tourism and domestic tourism, it's about 11% of global GDP. And it drives a lot of the business for, for Primeline. I mean, we, we are, a lot of the products that we're working with depend on consumer demand um, in all its dimensions. And a big chunk of that would be tourism. So prior to COVID, uh, China, you know, 250 billion spent by China on external tourism, typically the status from 2017 World Trade Organization data. That's a typical number for 18 and, and 19 and beyond. So that number's crashed away. All tourism num numbers are down. So this is a huge, uh, huge effect. Um, when we then look at, okay, what, ha what, has, what, what, has, what has Primeline specifically been doing in, in this? Is there, is there an example of something we've done to help? Well, we work with the HSE. There was a project that emerged rapidly. Historically, we've never worked with Ireland's health uh, service executive, Ireland's uh, uh, government uh, public health system. But there was a project developed to help uh, patients um, who were very vulnerable from uh, the worst effects of COVID-19, essentially to measure their blood oxygen level uh, early and in the home where they're safe. So if they get, get COVID-19, the serious thing that can go wrong is your lung function collapses. And you kind of want to know if that's happening as early as possible, but, but from the safety of your own home. So uh, Dr. Martin Curley, um, Director of Digital Transformation in, in the, in the uh, Irish government's uh, health system, he developed a solution with a company called Patient Empower. They needed a logistics partner. We all got talking. We, we moved very, very fast. And in, and in a matter of days, we, we put in place the asset tracking and the delivery management service to make this happen for 10,000, up to 10,000 devices in the overall plan. Um, in terms of agile working, so COVID um, put pressure immediately on all businesses. And to talk specifically about, about Primeline on this, it's important to step back and talk about, well, what, what was Primeline's technology journey before this and how was that affected? So we have a, we have a digital strategy on a, on a slide enable business growth via more technology, essentially, you know, digitize, automate, simplify. Um, the center of this is to move from legacy uh, disjointed systems to a set of integrated systems so we can run our business better. We want to move from a world of being in business silos to being in a world of integrated systems. We've worked with uh, the IVI's methodology on this, the capability maturity framework for IT. We did an assessment we identified in detail where we were. We, we, we created a heat map on gap versus importance on specific processes, and we laid out a plan. And we've identified against the four macro strategies where to, where to, uh, where to proceed, move from being, you know, move, move the uh, technology department from being a technology supplier, you know, to, be, to become a business partner. And to do that in a set of controlled activities you know, get the technology capability stable first and then move up the pyramid so we can demonstrate value. So 
a lot of our time was in this past year on the core of getting the basics in place. Um, as we progress over time, the focus will change, but getting the basics in place was good because when COVID hit, having the basics in, pl in place was really, really what we needed. Um, so in specific, when I say getting the, basic, getting the basics in place, so there was five key things we needed to do fast. Remote working, communication, systems access, ensure we can, we can process orders and ensure or deal with how are, we, how are we printing, you know, what are we going to do there? So the starting point would have been that we had made great progress. We, as I said, we put in the firm foundation around the basics. Remote access was possible. We had a secure uh, VPN service. We had massively increased the bandwidth into our campus. Uh, Microsoft Office 365 Teams was in pilot form. Our firewall antivirus, we tidied all that up uh, in, 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 in late, by late 2019. And our, however, our order processing was still, as a business, very disjointed and still depending on a lot of paper. So when, when COVID hit, there was a massive push. Most of our staff, our administrative staff certainly moved to work from home. Uh, we were able to communicate we were able to access systems um, securely, and we had to rapidly develop uh, smarter ways of working around order processing electronically and drop other methods. We reduced our reliance on printing. And so in terms of lessons learned, sorry, in terms of lessons learned, um, we've identified gaps. We've identified a, a plan now uh, more around how to fully drive paper away and how to fully move to a portal model for all orders. Um, Everything else, we were fine. We were fine on remote working, fine on collaboration, fine on cybersecurity, but, but somewhat weak on the order management process and, you know, over-reliance still on paper. So a very, very basic thing. You know, um, right at the dawn of modern computing, those of you familiar with Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center back in the mid-70s, uh, at the time, Xerox was the world's largest um, photocopier company. And they were, they were afraid of the future. So they spoke to uh, um, Bob Metcalf, one of the great thought leaders in technology. And he said to them in 1975 that by 1980, there would be the paperless office. By 1980, the paperless office. And this frightened Xerox to the degree that they set up the research center. And from that research center, uh, the first um, GUI interface was developed, the mouse as we know it today. And uh, the first laser printer was developed as part of that project. And the first uh, communication between uh, what were essentially early PCs was, was, was demonstrated. So at the very dawn of, you know, if like modern computing, the assumption was that, you know, paper would be gone. And yet in every year since then, the amount of paper printed has continued to rise and rise and rise. COVID-19 may well change that trend. We may soon be in the paperless office. And it'll be a paperless virtual office too, perhaps. So in terms of the outlook, um, so trade is down. Now for Primeline specifically, um, a lot of what we are involved with is food and beverages. And generally that is not down. People still eat, people still drink, okay? But anything to do with uh, discretionary spend or tourism spend, that is definitely down. And overall, global trade over the next 12 months, some, some economists predict that it will be down perhaps 25% uh, year on year. Um, despite that, the world continues. The world continues to grow. Um, just prior to COVID, just prior to COVID, uh, the analysis on where would all of the growth come from you know, in, in the year 2020, 26.6% from China and 14.4% from India. And these two economies are the only two that will probably grow this year out of, out of the world's large economies. Every other, every other economy will see a shrink of some form. Um, in, in Ireland in particular, we're seeing yeah, local demand is down, as I mentioned. Um, Ireland is a very small economy compared to these other economies, but uh, um, perhaps representative of a, of a typical Western European economy and how we're, how we're negatively impact, impacted. Um, but
but the future continues to advance towards us, right? Technologically, we've left five years into the future. Um, within a decade, China will be the world's largest economy. Within a decade, India will be the second largest. The US will have dri drifted to number three, Indonesia will be number four. So these trends are not going to change because of COVID. The world will adapt. The world will, the world will adapt, the world will go on. Um, the consumer is now very hygiene conscious, very personal health conscious, very wellness conscious, mental health, physical health, hydration, vitamin D, et cetera. We all are. COVID-19 will continue to mutate. We don't know when we'll see a vaccine. We hope we'll see one this year. If there is the, 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 in, in, the, in the spread of possibilities, there's everything from we'll see one in December 2020, or we'll see one in, in you know, late 2021, or we'll never see one at all. Who knows? The world has changed in that regard, but the digitization of our economy and our supply chains has accelerated. So hopefully I've left you with, with the, the view anyway from, from Primeline that the world of 20, COVID-19 is the new normal. COVID-19 COVID created a time machine and every business is a digital business now. Thank you. Thank you so much for scaring the crap out of me at the very end. That's excellent news. <laughs> John, thank you so much. That was really, really great and I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if I can get the other guys back up on screen now, if they all want to pop their little faces back on there and turn their videos back on. See if we can facilitate some Q&A. No open questions. Well, don't be shy, people. Um, I am just going to get rid of that then and ask some questions of my own. Have we got the other two? Dirk, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? There you are. Oh, perfect. We got. Where's Patrick? Here. Can you see me? There you are. Now, now I've got a full house. Now I've got a full house. Now that I can see you all again. So let's have a chat. Um, I mean, it's really interesting. I know we talked a lot about retail and I suppose my own background in Siemens would be much more on the manufacturing side. And uh, Patrick, you did cover that. But obviously, um, as we talk about convergence, a lot of what we have applied in terms of automation and digitalization in manufacturing is moving much more into that retail logistics space as you know, because it's the technology that gives us that proximity to customers. Um, we've lost Dirk again. Good Lord, nothing like technology to let us down. So we're, we're missing out on perfect, John. But um, I really think, you know, John's comment about this time machine is really interesting. Um, and, it, and, that, and that does feel very real to me. You know, we have talked about paperless office. I haven't had cartridges in my printer since the start of this. And I just haven't bothered now because I just don't print anything anymore. And, uh, you know, people, and that's that sense of we behave differently online to how we behave offline. We also behave differently in our work practices at home to when we're in, we're off, in our offices. And a lot of people now are talking about working from home burnout, you know, because it is more intense and we're online all of the time. But to go back to the point of logistics and um, in relation to John's comment about this time machine, Patrick, is that your experience now? How do you see that changing in terms of you know, some of the research trends that you would have seen heretofore? Well, um, actually, we, we have seen uh, what, what we expected sh should be coming. First of all, is, uh, as we said, this shift to, okay, how can we be more flexible? Because we, we don't know what's going to happen. So we, we are in a much more uncertain world. Um, and um, so there, there's probably some, some work carrying on about, you know, how can we shift from one model to another? You know, no, nobody knows if you know, the shops will remain closed or with limited access in six months. Or as you said, we'll find a vaccine and everybody, everybody will be back to normal uh, in the next three months. So I think that a lot of work will be about this flexibility or you know, looking at different scenarios and how can, I, you know, how can I anticipate either one or the other. And technology will definitely be there uh, because one of the scenarios, which is the one we are currently now, is fully digital. But and those who haven't been digital, basically, they, they, they won't survive. But you made, you made that point, if we have a vaccine, we'll go back to normal in three months. 
I, I don't know that we will. I, I think that what we Pandora's box has been opened, and, and as John said, you know, the Stone Age didn't stop because we ran out of stones. We found something better. So, you know, we've got bronze. Oh yeah, but I want to go back to stones. No one wanted to go back to stones. You know, how many people are going to, I, I understand, you know, obviously from a, a psychological point of view, from our mental wellness, there's certain things that we do want to go back to. Quite fancy seeing my parents again someday. Um, but there are, there are other things that I think people are not going to want to do. And indeed, commercial decisions that businesses are going to make saying, why were we building very, very expensive white elephant offices in very, very expensive real estate, choking our cities, when we can work at a satellite hubs at the peripheries of cities, have more people working from home, have much more dynamic work time. The implications of logistics, and because I, I do want to talk about logistics occasionally here, is this idea that, you know, I suppose one of the biggest challenges most businesses have in particularly in large cities is congestion you know, and scheduling. And anybody that we work with, scheduling is a huge problem. We can, they, they can schedule production from when the lorry arrives at the, at, the, at the site, at the processing site, and how it goes through their system. But what we can't do, that's only as good as the chain is only as strong as its weakest link on how well we can predict when they're going to arrive, what they're going mm -hmm. to have. So obviously there may be, just in terms of, you know, uh, ground transport, certainly not sea and air, but ground transport. Will we have greater fluidity here if we've got less congestion? Well, this is already uh, already happening. So the, the uh, we used to have indeed more congestion in the past, but congestion is also something that can be anticipated. You know, if we have the appropriate software, we know what's going to happen. It's just a matter of anticipating, you no know, future congestion. So uh, it's not as much as a matter of reliability but really about knowing where your bottlenecks will be. Uh, nowadays, we have no more congestion, but the problem is not anymore, but it's more about having enough truck drivers because you know, demand has soared so much for last mile delivery that we don't have enough people to, to, to make that transport happen. And the yeah. same applies to the warehouses. Now, we, we don't have enough people to, uh, not enough infrastructure to make this happen. Um, and, and again, there is this question about you know, how sustainable this will be. Uh, we, as we said, we, we might not be going to a full normal, but you know, if, if things, if we have a solution, whatever, we might become coming back to some kind of normality. So you know, um, today there's this real question about, you know, and, and logistics uh, is about people, uh, although you know, we, we have more and more automation, uh, you know, many of the businesses, and especially as products are not built for warehouse, you know, the products have diverse size and force. Uh, the more those products are diverse and not built with the purpose of going online, uh, you know, the more we need um, flexible you know, warehouses or basically people picking things and putting them into, into boxes. Um, and yeah, and to, today we are, we are still between the two worlds, I would say. I had a very interesting conversation this morning um, in relation to uh, vertical agriculture mm -hmm. and the idea, you know, an, an urban farming so that we can shorten the distance between where food is grown and how it arrives in the supermarket. And the reality is it doesn't go anywhere because you grow it vertically on the roof of, of the depot of the supermarket and you literally just harvest your own. Some of the challenges that certain food and veg companies have dealt with in the last couple of whiles could be certainly offset by things like that. And um, now we do have some questions coming in online. Um, so the first is from Claire Thornley. Um, what can we do to avoid potential negative about working from home and other emerging working models that are being adopted very speedily without perhaps much oversight? Now, I, I have to say we're very, there's a great oversight in Siemens. Like I am here in my fully adjustable chair. I worked from home before. So it was a quite easy transition for me. I wasn't all the time at home, which I am now, but um, I do think for other people uh, and other industries, they weren't as set up for it. And people have had to jump in very, very quickly. They're doing it at home now where, you know, in a normal working from home environment, I work from home, I live alone. Um, so it's easy for me, but there are people trying to work from home when their kids would ordinarily be back at school. It'll probably be easier, I suspect, when their kids do get to go back to school. But for now, it's really challenging. And um, so, <clears throat> 
John, I'm going to put that one to you. You've got a big team. I can tell from the roof, the ceiling behind you, you are in fact in an office space, are you? I'm at work today. Yes, indeed. Yes. Well, we're all at work today. We're just not doing it in an office. The language has to change. The yeah. language has to change. We're not going back to work. I'm already at work. I haven't stopped. So really what it is, it's, it's a lot to do with um, organizational culture and maturity. So uh, the most effective organizations are very good at managing by outcome, you know? Yeah. So rather than try to micromanage people and tell them what to do, it's a matter of outcome. And, you know, industrial psychologists will always report that when people are given trust and responsibility, they are motivated by that. When people are distrusted and micromanaged, it's deeply uh, demoralizing and uh, counterproductive. And it, there's a certain style of leader that's needed uh, in 2020. So before COVID, this was already an issue in organizations. It just COVID puts the spotlight on lousy, lousy managers and great managers. Great managers can inspire. Great managers lead. They can build trust. They know how to do that. They know how to motivate and they know how to inspire and build teamwork and build a great future. Lousy managers crush people's will to live and exude lack of trust and uh, intimidate, bully, micromanage, send crazy emails at 2 a.m., and are appalling. And in, in great organizations, they have 360 reviews to find these guys and get them out of there. The in, but in the organizations, is, they well, value those people. But, so, they have, but their challenges that exist in an office environment as well as absolutely. an Absolutely, it just is more obvious when you're at home. I they, think, um, so, so Owen has got his hand up and he has got a question here, but just to finish out that point, like there, I know uh, Tracy Keogh, for example, has done phenomenal work on remote working over the last year, um, or geez, the last three years, but certainly looking at remote working now as a skill and remote managing as a skill, which does, you know, and actually cultivating those skills in management. Um, Patrick, you're from an academic environment. I've worked in DCU myself. It is a much more autonomous structure, I find a lot of times in universities. So less probably less of a pressing day-to-day -day challenge, but I'm not going to dismiss that, but I do want to go to Owen's question. So I'm going to just leave that hanging in there and you can contradict me in a moment if you need to. But Owen's point is this, it's one of those uh, questiony statements. Is this not just a function of management, as John has correctly said? Many are going to be found out as they lack the, the intellect and ability to think in a lateral manner or are completely slaves to process rather than using them as a guide. I actually think that's possibly a reflection on our talk about technology as much as the one from working from home, in the sense that a lot of the challenges that we're facing now require brilliant uh, lateral thinking and creativity. And certainly, to, to Patrick's point in the, in the first presentation, and I think, John, you, you certainly um, backed this up in, in your experience, but it is, if we're gonna build the new normal, let's build it right this time and not just go back to what we had or a digitized version of what we had, but look for where the disruption can now take place that has been accelerated, where we've really been able to test what, how consumers are going to behave in, it, in a very different world and what it is that we go back to and what it is we don't go back to, that we don't want to go back to. So um, the World Economic Forum had... Um, they published a report there a while ago on the skills needed for the fourth industrial revolution. And they were critical thinking, complex problem solving, and creativity. Now I have a personal uh, ax in the, in the creativity space, so I'm loving that. But I would always argue that it's impossible to do the other two unless you've got a degree of creativity anyway. But that um, everything that's happening now in the world is accelerating all of that and actually forcing people to tap into and practice that creative muscle. Yes, uh, it is true. And, and as you yeah. were saying, oh, you're right. And, and it is correct. And as we were saying, now this, we all have to learn uh, work digitally. And even in universities, you know, <laughs> even for many lecturers are used to work from home and for you are already into that, that kind of world there's still a lot of change, you know, processes that are not the same. Um, we have to redesign courses and, we, and our students as well 
learning to work uh, online and from work. And, and we are now telling them now, get, this is a new normal. So don't run away. You have to learn. To, you, they, I mean, they are, of course, in many aspects, much more advanced, advanced than we were <laughs> in broadcasting videos and doing that kind of things. But now um, we are really putting that as a, a skill that they have to develop, learning I how to behave in meetings, uh, no, online meetings, maybe respecting schedules, which I didn't do fully, <laughs> but no. So these are definitely new skills that we are putting to our students that we have to, because there's no other way uh, to assess them without this contact. And, and um, it's not just about you know, putting a platform, uh, contact is still important. You know, we, we organize meetings and uh, reports, presentations, where there is this face-to-face -face, uh, process, but through this online. Uh, so I, I was reading this morning that um, Oxford University, I think it's Oxford, said that there will be no, all lectures will be online until the summer of 2021. And um, that ties to what uh, to John was saying about MIT. But it also strikes with a conversation I was having again with colleagues the other day on the work that we do in smart campuses. You know, Siemens do a lot of work, many universities around the world, particularly in the UK, um, about, you know, what is a smart campus? Well, a smart campus is, is certainly changed now in the context of a lot of lectures have moved online. So arguably, why are students facing the perilous task of trying to find accommodation in you know our major cities when they can actually access um, and, and they're making college choices where they go depending on what is potentially logistically the easiest for them to get to speaking of logistics and uh, and now they can actually access any education from anywhere but to to dirk who is not with us online but i i do want to really you know point to the example he gave about the wine tasting and the richness of experience and how we can create rich experiences yes. um, that are not, you know, just because we don't want to lose those elements. You know, we've been to university. University is in hell, is, there's an awful lot more to our academic, to, well, certainly to my uh, experience of university than always just what I heard in lectures. It's, it's a rite of passage, it's part of life, it's where we make very formative relationships in life. And I'm not going to talk about normal people, um, but you know, um, but you know, there, there's a lot of that richness that we don't want young people to lose. And so in the example he gave around wine tasting, you know, how do we give them the richness of that experience in a smart campus environment when the campus is, is, is online? Yeah, I mean, all that has to be invented uh, and we are starting to do that. Uh, and it is true that, you know, although people are in their own computers and as we said, we might go back to normal at how many, how much that normal will be, there will be definitely more of that online interaction. And nobody does anything on, on, on its own. No, no person do things on its own. We all are collaborating and working together. And that it's something important that now we all know each other. Um, still, the, the process is still early enough where people have knew, knew each other physically, so we had that kind of confidence and trust. Uh, and if we stay on that system for a longer period of time, we'll have to learn to you know, work with people we've never seen before uh, and, or only online and build that confidence and that trust. And this is definitely something that, that we, we have to learn uh, to do. So that, that idea of working in, in groups and effectively in, in behaving well in, in groups. So can we talk about just supply chain here for a second in sure. terms of logistics? And, and I agree with your point there. I don't know what point it was that you were saying that made me think of it, but yeah, it was this idea of smart campus. So they stay away. So, you know, we talk a lot about sustainability and I remember being at a meeting uh, late last year and I said, well, you know, you can get to zero carbon you know, by the 1st of January. And they said, how? I said, well, close everything down, leave, yeah. stop. You know, you're going to hit your goals. But, you know, if you were to get to low carbon transport, the first thing you would do is eliminate all unnecessary transport. Mm -hmm. And then you look at necessary transport and you try to make that as short as possible. In terms of the future of supply chain and supply chains, and, and I think you raised it in one of your slides, um, was this where you know, the future of globalization and very long, you know, we've shortened the time it takes to get product from one side of the world to the other. It's not, you know, on a cargo ship taking, you know, four months to get to the, to the other side, but um, we've, sh we've shortened the time it takes, but should we be shortening the footprint altogether? 
and the, the just the, the the journey. And again, to that question, the, the conversation I was having this morning about um, virtual farming, you know, and creating, um, you know, controlled growing environments. A lot of things that you can't grow in Ireland, you could with the use of technology and um, climate control within a, in a contained environment. How much can we actually um, slice out of the supply chain? And I'm looking at John, I'm hoping he's blinking and his green hasn't frozen or that he's just frozen in horror. Yay. <laughs> do you want to take that one, John? Do you see your, do you see any changes there in terms of we're now in 2025? And um, we're not going to move stuff from the far side of the world to here anymore. We're going to shorten our supply chain, globalization, those parts coming out of, you know, the other side of the world. We're going to try and get them manufactured closer to home now. We're going to, you're shaking your head. Okay, hit me. Okay, so um, three weeks ago, oil traded at minus $37 a barrel in West Texas. In other words... I had a contract to buy oil. No one would buy it off me, even at zero. So I have to pay somebody to take it away. So if, if fuel is cheap, people will move stuff around the world. Um, supply chains are highly integrated and at huge scale. You know, the sun, so for example, in China, SunTech solar power, solar panel factory uh, is enormous, largest solar power factor in the world. You say, well, how big is it? Okay, well, here's, here's, a, here's a, an indicator of how big it is. In their canteen at lunchtime, in the kitchen, they use six million eggs at lunchtime to make in the food, right? So lunchtime, six million eggs every, every day. That gives an idea about how big, well, how big is that factory then? Oh my God. So that factory is unlikely to be split down into more economical, smaller units anywhere else. Um, I think it's, a, it's very difficult to see how, how this evolves. Um, uh, you know, the, pri the market price and the, and the product quality and the service efficiency, these things dominate the, 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 the surface decision, you know, the optimizer, you know, press optimize, doop, where's the best place? And that'll continue. Um, but can I just hold you there for a second? Um, in, in the in reflection on the, the idea of, you know, oil being really cheap, it, it always reminds me, and uh, Donald Carroll well, in Siemens always, because he now quotes me back to myself, which I quote off a birthday card, just because you can, can, doesn't mean you should, should. And so, um, you true. know, in, 20, in 2025, where we are now, then the climate change um, pressures are going to be exponentially high. We've now given the entire planet uh, breathing space for six months and we've seen that that does work. So it's now 2025 and we're saying, I don't care how cheap your oil is, you'll literally have to pay me to take it away because we're not gonna be, that's not how we're gonna move things from now on. So on that basis, removing the possibility of it's just, it's cheap to transport that way. Is there a better way? I, I think the, the push for renewables is going to continue. Um, it's economically driven, you know, solar and wind, you know, governments have no to make carbon taxes. They'll be economically driven too. So, uh, you know, yeah. if, if the, the cheap oil is not enough to offset the cost of the carbon taxes you're going to be hit with, what's the alternative? Like, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying I know the answers, but I'm electric, just... The electric vehicles, you know battery you know you, you know the, the you know eventually the oil runs out i mean when in the future but eventually there's no oil but um the advantages in auto the advances in autonomous vehicles and battery battery research continues so you can imagine a world in which you know that happens you know someone mentioned earlier that you know that, that there's a ferocious demand because of direct to consumer there's now a ferocious demand for last mile deliveries everywhere so there aren't enough drivers so. I know Nigel, my DPD driver, <laughs> he, I now call, I don't know the name of my postman, but I know that Nigel is the DPD guy who's been here. It's not me. It's my birthday on Monday and people keep sending me stuff now. So it's very nice, but I'm not complaining. But uh, yeah, I do. I am now on first name terms with the last mile delivery driver on my road. Well, that's going to the, 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 you know, the whole world. So, you know, um, retail, 
if you take retail in in North America, Walmart uh, suffered their first ever quarter of declining sales about a year ago. So long before COVID, you mm. know, Walmart had peaked. Something had changed. Uh, IKEA, uh, for the first time in their history, closed the store. The one in the northeast, of, north Midlands of England, somewhere near York. First time in their history, they closed the store. They're always very careful where they build them. Yeah. And in, in North America, there are many, many, many abandoned, abandoned shopping malls. So there's been a trend underway for quite a while for people to shop from home and uh, not go to the store. And that's been accelerated. So I, I, I think that a lot of shops that have closed are never going to, they're never going to reopen because the, the demand has shifted to a more convenient alternative. And the last one, the truck, you know, getting the stuff to the home is the, is where the energy is moving to away from opening the store. Apple during Apple were one, were one of the first companies to shut their shops in North America. They shut them in a week and in a week, they move to become an online business in one week. And can we talk about um, then in the context of that last mile delivery and Nigel, is that the, my parents have a robotic lawnmower that they call Jasper. Am I going to be on first name terms with the uh, drone that, it, or am I going to give him a nickname and uh, I'll hear him whizzing in the garden and dropping off packages here instead of the magpie that's currently living down there. So, um, you know, in terms of last mile, do you see drone deliveries on the rise, for want of a better point? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure about this. Um, I'm not sure it's the most energy efficient way to transport products. Mm -hmm. um, I see last mile delivery improving. Again, just a guess, of course. Uh, I don't see global trade reducing significantly. I mean, the, the growth won't be maybe driven by global trade as it has been. And actually, since the 2008 crisis, now, uh, global trade has been growing at a similar rate as GDP. You know, GDP. So we, we, that has already been a change. But, uh, but when you talk about environment, um, the question around environment is, is mostly about the global life cycle of your product and not just the distance uh, from the production place to the uh, delivery place. Uh, so it depends a lot on, you know, for example, how the shipping uh, industry can reduce their own emissions. Um, they, they, they've, since, 2000 and, yeah, since the late 2000s, they have started to think about that. Um, and, um, and basically, when you think about global emissions, because we're talking about the environment, you know, the, the, the air freight industry, you no, know, the air freight is represent like point, really 2% of global emissions for nearly very small amount of, 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 of you know, value other than people traveling around and very high value products like PP, PP, PPI recently. Uh, but shipping industry for the same amount, like roughly two, 3% of emissions, they transport about 60 to 70% of products in volume. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so distance is not the only factor to consider when you think about those things. Now, if we have products here being grown in, in, in our end, uh, that's okay, but Things need to be warm <laughs> and kept warm, and that that costs up. Or okay. cold. Or when cold. Whatever. This is whatever yeah, way. So this is right. we have to think as a global life cycle. Where is the best place to uh, yeah. grow something uh, or to manufacture something? Because there's also the issue of you know, where the resources are, where the labor and the skills are, um, and then we have just to think as a an over perspective, what's the best solution for a specific product? And of course, that applies also to people working from home. So everybody has been warned yes. you're going to get us, you know, expect some sticker shock on your next electricity price, your electricity bill, because you're at home, you're using your own electricity far more. When you're in the office, you're using someone else's electricity, your company is paying for it. So now you're absorbing your own cost of having all these devices charging all around me all the time. And, um, and actually that is, is the increased usage because we all get economies of scale you know it's not like someone else paying for it but there are economies of scale for heating one building that there's 500 people in as opposed to heating five homes separately where they may not ordinarily have had the heat on during the day so are running as many machines or whatever so um actually which is greater the carbon footprint of driving up to the office or the increased carbon footprint of having your office you know, we will learn that soon, probably. Uh, we're we're going to find out. I'm, I'm going to look. I'm going back to the, my screen here. I can see that Owen has come back with another remark. So he says, much of the organizational behavior 
in traditional enterprises, unfortunately, revolve around politics. Well, I don't see that's going to change. And this crisis provides a golden opportunity to break this toxic culture that is all too pervasive, I suppose, depends on where you work on. And smart people who are results driven and have the time and space to harness their intellect will excel. Clever managers and key decision makers and organizations will recognize this. Look, at I think you know, there is a, a maturity in organizations in relation to uh, looking at outcome results oriented measurement of work rather than the presenteeism stuff but you know it's not the number of hours in your day but you know then the, the what you're getting done in those and the productivity and yes I think that but I, I don't you know I don't think all politics is toxic culture either and uh, you know I don't want to be too negative about it on some of it could be very good you know depends on where you work we're all very happy <laughs> Um, I don't know if I, I, I'm very conscious it's now four o'clock we were meant to be doing networking for the last half an hour oh we've got another we've got another point we've got someone Emmanuel Kiprias has, has messaged in it seems to me that we're talking about digitization innovation in the present environment but before we do that we need to solve important issues like cyber security as John briefly discussed Mersk example can you elaborate on that John, would you like to elaborate on cybersecurity? Because if you don't want to, I know someone who does. Go oh, ahead. Um, in this time of COVID-19, everyone is running around panicking and blinkered, focusing on you know narrow things. Meanwhile, the unscrupulous ransomware villains are sitting in their chair, swiveling, eating donuts, and tapping at their keyboard, <laughs> and then trying to find some poor unfortunate, okay, to hack and steal the data and all the horrible things. So cybercrime, this is a terrible time for this problem because it's a target rich with more people working from home, more data flow, more access points into company networks through mobile phones, yeah. through laptops at home, through family members' laptops, huge opportunity to attack, come in through strange vectors. The most common attack is the email that looks like it's from your boss telling you, here is your thing, please and, click. And you're most likely to open a phishing email. Yes. I have to say when, now again, I'm a bit privileged here because I'm on my Todd, um, but you know, there's someone screaming beside you or someone has just spilt something all over the floor. That's what, and I've noticed, I do it myself, you know, and we've all done it. So, you know, let's not pretend we haven't, but, Thankfully, I've been very lucky. They were just tester ones, which I failed. Um, but yes. it was it was a moment when I was actually trying to do two things at once. Yeah, and that's and on and call, also on mobile devices. On mobile and, and, devices, it's also more yeah. difficult to see the full email, uh, yeah. and sometimes that happened as well. So um, yeah, because it strips away the thing. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's dodgy. The header it, disappears. Yeah, can't see it. yeah. I, I have to say, my I, I feel very bad. I wish he was here. Um, my colleague, Wayne Bercy, uh, if anyone does want to have a very, I shouldn't be plugging, but if anyone does want to have a very deep conversation about cybersecurity, particularly in the area of logistics, Wayne Bercy, my colleague, is your man. Um, so I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to anyone about it, but you're right, John. I mean, everybody, there's, there's so many people too who are, who are inexperienced shopping online for the first time, you know, just in terms of consumers and credit card fraud. I know the bigger issue for a lot of us here on this audience in this group is in relation to, you know, their own business. But it is a, a particularly, as you say, t a very porous time um, with so many people working off remote devices and uh, and probably a little bit more distracted than they were in a very locked down safe office environment. I don't know, Emmanuel, if that answers your question or if you want us to talk some more about it. Patrick, look, he looks poised. He's going to say something else. So far ahead. Patrick, I'm going to keep going, Paul, Paul Hyman, and can you tell me to stop? We're going to keep chatting. So, you know, to, anyone can put in a comment or, or a question that the question can be, can you close now? Because we want to go and do something else, but we'll just power on chatting if it's okay with you guys. Patrick? Uh, it's fine with us, Joan. Uh, uh, I'm finding this, uh, you know, very, very interesting, this conversation. Um, Good. Yeah, we, we don't put the kettle on. I, I was waiting for dirt before the wine. <laughs> It'll get to that time. I have to tell you, there's a painting behind me, and it's to cover. That's where my drinks are kept. And the boy said it might look more professional if I covered it. 
So, you know, we'll go to that later if anyone needs to. What I was going to say, though, earlier as well was just to add that, um, to put it into context, um, to answer the, help answer the question that was raised. Um, yes. An approach in all of this is to take a framework approach, a maturity approach, to say, okay, look, um, uh, put it into context. Um, what is the current state of maturity in process terms, organizational terms, and technology terms for cybersecurity in your organization? And there are a number of frameworks that I've seen that are very good at that. And it, because you'll have to build a business case to explain to the executives, look, this is the issue uh, on a scale of one to five, we're at 1.2, which is a bad place to be. So here's where we are. We don't have antivirus, we don't, whatever it is, right? Number one. Number two, to uh, create and maintain a risk register as an enterprise and ensure that cybersecurity is in there as a risk and that you have a set of acknowledged issues and actions and that you're, you're basing that on likelihood and impact. Um, so you, you're, you're appealing to the executives in your company's sense of risk. Can I, can do you think that this uh, entirely, the unimaginable has happened? Um, it was a different kind of threat. It's, it's a different, you know, it's not, it's, yeah. it, you know, but now that the unimaginable has happened in the physical world, it's possible that the unimaginable is now going to also happen in the technological world, do you, in the cyber world, do you think it's an easier sell now? I think uh, I think everything. I think everyone is rattled. Everyone's certainties have been ripped out from under them. People are no longer certain about their name, the day of the week. If I press two, does that take me to the second floor or the third floor? <laughs> it is definitely a good time for those kind of approaches now. As we said, um, companies have been doing business continuity planning products. I mean, since I mean. Basically, since 2001, you know, uh, 9 11, I think there was a big awareness. And when we see publications about risk management, they started to, you know, to, to pop out in 2002, 3, 4, 5, and then you know, more things happened. Uh, you know, the list, I think John showed a very long list of <laughs> disasters. Uh, that, so we know how to do, you know, companies are aware of that. And the IT is definitely one of the components that's always there when we work in a business continuity plan. Um, <clears throat> We have a lot of risks assessed in the pandemic, and IT is definitely one that has to be there, it's always there. Uh, and so um, I think that what we have to do now is to push, as you said, this a bit further, and not only think in terms of, you know, what if my sales, can I cope with a 20% increase in sales, or within 10 days, or can I cope with that kind of risk? You know, we have to push that, those scenarios probably a bit further away. Uh, in terms of you know, per risk correlations. Now, it's not what if my firewall goes down, what if this warehouse burns, but think in terms of a more systemic approach and what if, as we said, all this come together uh, in a correlated manner, um, including for IT. Um, and so I think that kind of you know, bold thinking in terms of <laughs> disasters is definitely the new norm. And that's definitely, I think, when we, we, we talk about the new normal, uh, I think definitely thinking in terms of the accepting the unmanageable as a possible uh, possibility is something that probably is going to become a new normal. Uh, we, there's a, too many times we, we knew things could happen, but we just didn't want to. 9-11, uh, we knew that anyone could get into a plane. We knew it. We just didn't want to see it. Uh, pandemic, we knew it. We had plenty of them coming. We just didn't want to see it. Um, and I think it's it's something that we have to learn is to look at, okay, those things, they can happen. Uh, we don't want them to happen, but we have to plan for, you know, plan for th that situation. And of course, there's a cost. There's a premium to pay. So, you know, if, if I want to be ready for that risk, that's how much I, want, I have to pay in terms of extra inventory, backing up whatever I want. But do I want to pay for that? And that's the question that we have to think of. Because if disaster doesn't happen, and I've been paying for that too much while I'm out of the market because the other ones haven't paid for it. Um, and that's a trade-off that needs to be thought uh, in detail. And you know, how, how much do I want to be insured? Uh, and what are other people doing as well is an important one. We call that you know, strategic mimetism. Uh, now, if everybody falls with me, I'm fine. Uh, if I'm the only one falling, then I'm in trouble, in big trouble. So 
I think you've seen that in retail, certainly in smaller businesses yeah. who haven't, not from a perspective of cyber security, but looking at what other people are doing and, you know, never really thinking, oh, but they're always, well, but my di- business is different and people will always need to come into my store because I'm high end and it's small. Mm-hmm. And they are now scrambling, you know, trying to show a video on Instagram with no, a website with no prices on anything and no shopping cart. And they're telling you to ring them and you're just going, it's 2020 people like COVID or no COVID it's 2020. How have you not got an e-commerce business set up by now? But they, they actually thought they were immune to it. And it wasn't even a case of, you know, how do I insure myself against this thing? It was a lack of acceptance of where we're going and what, you know, kind of conversations that we're having with businesses now want to have more is, you know, I'm, I'm, digitalization for me is not so much about you know how we can optimize performance for you now it starts with a conversation around what are you going to be making 10 years from now because the market's going to totally have changed so what are you going to be actually making 10 years from now how are you going to be solving consumers the consumer need 10 years from now and then let's talk about how you're going to be serving that and then what you need to do change to achieve it. But it has to start with the question of 10 years from now. And we're already five years from now, given the, the, the little time machine. So really let's ask ourselves, based on where you were in January, what are you going to be doing 15 years from now? Because it's, that's the real value I see in digitalization beyond the optimization of what's already there and what you're already doing it's where the disruption is going to come from and sometimes most of the time that disruption generally it doesn't come from within it's happening in the market it's either political policy is going to change it economics is going to change it society is going to demand change or technology is going to force it they're the things that drive disruption and if you're not the disruptor you're the disrupted that's it. You better figure out which one you're going to be and then look at how ridiculous that disruption, because it's, it's going to be something you hadn't imagined. So let's start pushing ourselves to going to the unimaginable and saying, do you know what? It's every likelihood this is where the market's going to be. We're going to have to start planning for that now. Because if you try to do it in the three month window of the COVID crisis, you're realizing just how hard it is to deliver change in that level of chaos. And that brings back to what we were saying before, which is the uh, ability to learn and to redesign your systems uh, is a crucial skill. I mean, if we are going to war, not want to be ready for those situations. This ability to redesign your, your uh, being a critical thinker, a problem solver, uh, these are skills that will really, really uh, well, become more and more crucial as we are going to, towards a more certain world. Um, <laughs> So, well, yes. <laughs> I, I've just gotten a very uh, subtle as a sledgehammer. Uh, no, I've gotten a lovely note here on the little private chat that tells me that's a great note to wrap up on, Joan. So, <laughs> so guys, um, thank you so much for the chat. John, it was lovely to see you again. It's been ages. Patrick, we've never met before, but it's been absolutely lovely chatting to you this afternoon. I hope everybody listening in had a good time and uh, by all means ping us any of us I'm sure an yeah. email or a LinkedIn or whatever get in touch if you want to talk about anything in more detail I know Paul um, and the guys at IVI um, will be coordinating all that and probably getting out slides to any of you and all of you but for my part my lovely guests and the IVI for inviting me along this afternoon thank you all very much I'm going to turn around now and see what's in the behind the painting in the white no I'm not <laughs> in the wine cupboard guys thanks a man so the next one we've got is coming up on, on uh, June 4th. And um, we've got a you know, good uh, lineup of speakers, Martin Curdy, who John you know, talked about in, in his presentation from the HSE. Um, uh, Martin will give us uh, you know, some insight into to what the health service in, in Ireland has been facing over the last number of months and, and some of the innovations that have taken place there. Matt Malarkey is an excellent speaker from the University of South Florida. Gary O'Mara from Mead Enterprise is gonna talk about how local businesses uh, in Ireland and in the Mead area to stay in touch with us we have a newsletter and twitter account we're active on social media on ivi you can sign up to our newsletter etc uh, hopefully we'll see the folks back here again in in a couple of weeks time